Camera looks okay. God, that's... Hmm. I feel like it's, my head's extra shining this evening. I know I just showered, but... Hold on a tick. Let's get the music going. A little bit of chill lo-fi tunes while we check out some lore. And hold on, I'm gonna... Check out the camera, see if I can't... Make my head a little bit less shiny. There we go. That helps, I think. Let's bring it down a little bit. Hmm. I feel like my face is... I know I got some sun. Yeah, whatever. Good enough. All right. Welcome back to the show. We're doing a little bit of lore equals gameplay tonight instead of playing Star Citizen. Um, I had to take a break from uh, podcasting and, and doing my, my regular content when the twins came. And so I'm a few months behind when it comes to uh, checking out the lore of Star Citizen, the lore updates. And normally I check out the uh, Galactopedia updates and explore those uh, with the aid of the Arc Star map for uh, location-based stuff um, every month when those come out. And I haven't done it since the April update. So we're doing the September update tonight. And then we I'm going to go backwards and do August, July, June, and May. So I got four more after this one to do to catch up. And that way we'll be we'll be up to speed. And it's going to look weird on my YouTube page, but these don't get a whole lot of views anyway. I do these, you know, mostly just cuz I would be doing it anyway. I'm like, "Yeah, let's make the content." And uh you know, every little bit counts. So, let's go ahead and uh switch screens and we'll move over to the one with the viewing window so we can take a look at the Galactopedia update. Alrighty. So, uh, the... Oh, here, let's get rid of the bookmark. Bar. There we go. That's better. Alright, so the uh, every month, the... Uh, Sherry Heiberg, the archivist for CIG, uh, updates the Galactopedia with a, a series of different articles. Um, usually there was one long article and then a series of short articles. Um, but it's uh, sort of done in the vein of uh, like an in-universe thing where um, the, uh, uh, the Galactopedia is, is sort of housed on the Ark, which is like this uh, human-built space station uh, in the Teok system, but it's meant to be like a universal repository of information, you know, sort of like a space version of the Library of Alexandria. And it's, it was sort of built as like an olive branch to the other species after the fall of the Mezers and the end of the the, the Cold War between the, Mezer, uh, the, the UEE and the Xi'an. Um, and, you know, it's had some marginal, marginal success, but, you know, it's, it's um, basically, you know, that that's the... the sort of in fiction version of where uh, the, the you know the storage of all the information we have available to us in the Galactopedia app when we get it um, in game will come from uh, it'll be a place that you can visit and when you up you know you the, the goal is that you'll be able to discover things and and witness events and such and that those sorts of things will be recorded in the Galactopedia uh, it'll be sort of a, a living living document I guess you could say uh, or, or living encyclopedia um, within the game. So, let's get started. Uh, the Arc Teok system. Welcome to September's Galactopedia Update Roundup. This month we explore the moons of the solar system, meet famed test pilot Michelle Seleno, um, and take a look at the history of the Rust Society. Join the Spectrum Thread for any discussion or feedback. Let's open up the Spectrum Thread real quick to see if there was any replies on anything of interest. Uh, nothing of interest, no replies from Sherry. Okay, cool. All right, so it's all short articles this evening. 
Um, but we've got the rest, uh, rest society and then Michelle Salino. So usually there's like a group and, or, uh, some famous figures. And then, um, it'll be things like, usually they'll like do a couple of star systems, but it looks like this time we're taking a look at only the soul system and it's really the moons and the, um, uh, an asteroid belt. Um, so I think while we'll add it, while we're at it, we'll also check out Mars um, and yeah, we'll check out Mars and the other planets in the galactic or the, Hey, Northern Trooper, how you doing, buddy? How's it going? Um, uh, but I feel like, uh, while we're in the solar system, um, here in the, uh, arc star map, we'll, we'll take a look at everything else and see, look at the little entries for those while we're at it. So the, Oh, actually. So one thing of interest that I always like to share with people is that uh, the solar system, as it's labeled on the Arc Star map, is 51 AU. So everybody's like, oh my god, that's huge. And it's like, well, it's it's more like a, a medium-sized system in Star Citizen, medium to large. Um, but the 51 AU actually comes from a size reference that's you know, uh, something that's used in real life. And 50, it's about 50, 51 AU um, from the sun, to the uh what's called the kuiper cliff which is basically where the the outer edge of the the kuiper belt where the number of uh objects that are like greater than 100 meters or was it 100 meters or 100 kilometers i forget basically falls off a cliff there it gets to the point where there's there's essentially nothing it's empty space um and that's, you know, the, the distance, that's the sort of size reference they're using for the solar system. So let's go ahead and get inside. But before we take a look at the solar system, let's read about the Rest Society. Um, and so like the Rest Society, a lot of people have the uh, Rest Society armor and spacesuit and stuff that was like a... Oh, I don't remember what it was a gift for, you know, at some point years ago. It's been in my... my um, inventory forever. Oh, come on. Rest Society. There we go. The Rest, uh, Rest Society is an organization of haulers and salvagers who mentor newcomers in both fields. Founded in 2423 by Franklin Knox Young, it began as an informal, irregular gathering of pilots who shared job postings with one, uh, with who shared job postings with one over glasses of rust, um, a potent grain alcohol. Over the years, it evolved into an information sharing and mentorship organization funded by membership dues and expanded onto other worlds. When military supply lines were interrupted during the first of Iron War, the Rust Society stepped in to help, leading to sharp increase in membership. Today, there are chapters in most UEE systems. So, not only is it a, um, you know, a, a group that shares job postings, um, but they also do, you know, an information sharing. So like you'll get, uh, you know, uh, in game we'll get, when you go to different systems, um, you'll be able to like get, uh, information updates about those systems and what's going on from the rest society. Like, you know, this is one of those things where if you have reputation with them, they'll give you information. They'll offer you, you know, jobs to do and such, um, both as haulers and salvagers. But the other thing is mentorship. And so this is one of those things where in the future, I, you know, because of the mentorship bit, I imagine, you know, after you start in the game and you do the, the new player tutorial guide, when you want to take your first hauling mission and learn about hauling cargo and moving cargo and stuff like that, or if you want to go learn about salvaging and, and pick the salvaging profession, they'll do like an in-game tutorial about those mechanics, you know, a, a sort of... Um, you know, just like you'd have in a single player game and it'll come from the Rust Society and you'll learn from them and they'll start off with them and then you'll be able to stick with them if you want or branch off to other organizations. But this is where you'll learn the trade, you know, of hauling and salvaging. So let's read about Michelle Saleno, founder of the 999th, which is the 999th Test Squadron. Um, if you remember the... Um, the sort of stunt pilots that you see in the commercials for Invictus Launch Week, that's the 999th. 
So Michelle Sal Saleno was a test pilot for the Amer uh, Amec Am Amecanio Navy. Um, so this is like way back in the, I think, before the United Planets of Earth. Yeah, if I'm right. So way, way, way back when. Um, and is best known as the first human to quantum travel be, uh, beyond the orbit of Jupiter, Sol 4, and for founding the 999th Test Squadron. Uh, Selena learned to fly from her parents, who owned an in-atmosphere agriculture in atmosphere agricultural aircraft and performed contra contract work as crop dusters. Can you imagine crop dusting in a spaceship? Like using your starfarer as a, a, a giant crop duster? <laughs> uh, she joined the Navy, you know, and obviously they're talking about aircraft, but like future crop dusting, crop dusting missions in game or something like that, you know, some ridiculous thing. Uh, her flying skills, fast reactions, deep technical knowledge, and daring attitude brought her to the attention of the Admiralty Board in Standard Earth Year 2124. Yeah, so way, way back. Um, and she was accepted into the Navy's Test Pilot Training Division. After graduating the program, she began working with improved versions of Robert Space Industries' Quantum Drive, eventually completing her test flight beyond Jupiter's orbit in 2128. Hey, socially confused. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you again. We're just uh, reading through some lore this evening. Uh, I think I'm going to do more Zero to Hero tomorrow, uh, depending on how much energy I have. I have to teach again uh, tomorrow afternoon. So we'll, we'll see how much uh, sleep the babies let me get um, uh, tonight uh, and, and how, how much energy I have after, after teaching tomorrow. Um, uh, and she was accepted into the Navy's Test Pilot Training Division. After graduating the program, she began working with improved versions of Robert Space Industries' Quantum Drive, eventually completing her uh, test flight beyond Jupiter's orbit in 2128. RSI reached out to Seleno in 2136 after the first model of their Zeus ship disintegrated during its test flight. Ooh. Yeah, a lot of Galactopedia updates. It's mostly the moons. So we're going to take a look at all these moons. But I, while we're doing that, I'm also going to take a look at the uh, the entries for the planets in the star map. Um, most of these are probably like the original entries and haven't changed. But some planets over the years have had their um, entries you know, on the star map updated. You know, did this, uh, you know, these little updates. So we'll take a look at those while we're at it, just for grins, um, along with a few of the, I think there's a couple of stations in here as well. Yeah. So, um, at Seleno's urging, the Navy agreed to establish the first incarnation of the 999th Test Squadron, a new wing of the Navy dedicated to developing and testing cutting edge spacecraft. The changes suggested by Seleno and her crew enabled RSI to successfully complete the Zeus allowing the company to release the first commercial quantum drive ship to the civilian market. Selena retired from the Navy in 2156 and spent the latter, la latter half of her life teaching at a flight school for underprivileged youth. So <clears throat> the 999th is a military unit. Um, and, and it's just like, uh, you know, units within our own military um, that test fly uh, experimental aircraft, you know, experimental test pilots. Um, and I think, yeah, but they're, they're also, they also do demonstrations. So it's like a mix of being an experimental test pilot, but also being like a blue angel kind of, I think it would be really cool if you could get some sort of reputation that allowed you to do what the 999th does, uh, as far as testing, uh, testing aircraft. And so, like, being able to go to, like, their, their headquarters and, hey, we need you to test fly this aircraft and we need you to, you know, follow this track or, um, you know, the, or, or fly in this, you know, testing area and we need you to push this aircraft to its, uh, this, this spacecraft to its limits, you know, you know, uh, execute a this many G turn within, you know, this, you know, tight of a, a turn, uh, this many G uh, turn within this much space or something like that. You know, really to be able to allow people who, you know, maybe really earn their spurs racing to go one step further 
and be able to, um, you know, you know, sort of set like performance records in different spaceships. Um, yeah, because obviously we know that different spaceships, you know, have your mark this, your mark that, and they're continuing to develop these these spaceships just like regular aircraft get developed. But like, you know, how cool would it be to, you know, say, you know, oh, okay, you know, I got recognized uh, in game for being this good of a pilot, and then I got to go here and fly in this, you know, test track, test zone area, uh, and accomplish, you know, these unique. Um, unique goals that you know essentially get you bragging rights and maybe allow you to get like you know socially confused uh the the, the f8 skin you know to be able to say oh yeah i did this you know the um it, it to allow rsi to continue to develop this ship or something like that and you know it doesn't mean the ship like would get developed faster you know because like you know real world uh things notwithstanding but it you know it would be really cool to be able to get those uh, sort of privileges and be able to demonstrate that so that way when people see your ship they're like whoa he's got that skin and the only way you get that is if you do you know this insane flying stuff you know for the 999th you know testing different spaceships hey danger hobo 07 good to see you buddy thanks for coming and hanging out again this evening i know that's my thought in terms of lore equals gameplay surrounding the 999th like yeah it's really cool to watch them in the um the the trailers and everything but you know i i would love for there to be a way to interact with them in game for for really hot shot pilots you know to, to really get people to to really push the limits of what's capable within the game and i know some people are like oh master modes and it's like well turn off master modes and you know fly in uh um uh, nav mode. Go fast. And dial the music back a little bit. Cool. All right, let's keep reading. So, Luna, Earth's one and only moon. Uh, let's see. So... Before we read about Luna, let's read about Earth. <laughs> yeah, I heard Master Mode. It's re... Yeah. Um, I, I always hear people complaining about speed and stuff, and I want to fly fast. Okay, well, then fly in Nav Mode. I can't do combat in Nav Mode. Okay, well, don't... Mm, combat isn't meant to be fast in Star Citizen. Sorry. It's meant to be close. Yeah. So... Uh, Earth, Sol 3, is the third planet from the sun of the solar system. The home world of uh, humans, it is the home of the Senate and the Imperator, the capital of the UE, and the focal point of commerce and culture. Corporations and governments have stripped Earth of most of its resources be uh, before humans began living on other planets, causing pollution, overcrowding, famine, and widespread death. Parts of Earth have recovered thanks to centuries of careful government management, but the population depends on imports to thrive. So I think that this part right here is going to sort of give them an out on how they design Earth, you know, and, you know, say uh, why certain areas have, you know, recovered and are natural looking, but otherwise, you know, we have, you know, multiple big, you know, mega cities and stuff. Um, but when they say widespread death and famine and all that sort of stuff, I don't think it means that, like, Earth went from a population of, you know, 40 billion to 8 billion, you know, and, and 32 billion people, you know, starved to death or something like that. I, I think it means that, you know, a lot of people died, but, you know, we have widespread death in on Earth now due to famine and overcrowding and starvation. So, like, you know, I, I don't think it's this extreme depopulation, you know, depopulating event that some people take this to mean. God dang it. Likely ban evader. Oh, Stupid bot. That's right. I've got you now. Hold on. Ban. And hold on. Report. Bot. Bot. You bot. Uh, 
There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Stupid bots. Okay, where were we? Um, yeah, so that's Earth. And, of course, Earth is way in here. Before we continue on and we read about Luna, let's see what the little entry is for Mercury and then the other one for Mars. I'm, like... A lot of people aren't excited or interested in going to Earth. They're like, oh, we already live in the solar system. It's like, no, you live on Earth. You've never explored Mars. You've never been to any of the, the massive moons around the gas giants and stuff. Like, I'm excited to go to the solar system because I want to see CIG's version of the solar system in the 30th century. And and more importantly, I want to see Mars and Port Renatus, you know, and, you know, Ceres and all that. So Mercury, due to an orbital eccentricity, this small planet experiences the greatest temperature variations of any planet in the system. And that's it. Venus. Venus's atmosphere is almost entirely composed of carbon dioxide, which makes it the hottest planet in the solar system. It's a smog planet. There's gonna be a lot of, there, there already are lots of smog planets uh, on the, the star map right now. We're gonna have smog planets. We're gonna have, they've talked about, the, the narrative team talked about this. Um, I think it was in one of the lore makers community questions where they, they said, there's gonna be planets where there really isn't a reason to go to them, you know, and technically you could land on the surface, but you know, you risk of severe damage to your ship, if not, you know, destruction and death. Um, you know, especially if you aren't properly equipped and there's not going to be a reason to do that. There might, you know, things like this, you know, there might be, you know, they, they have talked about some smog planets where there's ongoing experiments because we want to learn how to terraform them. You know, and so I could see like, you know, scanning them for different organizations and stuff, uh, maybe dropping probes in the atmosphere to, for different, uh, um, scientific experiments, but the, there's not really going to be a, a reason to land on the surface of a smog planet. You know, maybe fly down in the atmosphere to evade capture or, you know, uh, evade uh, uh, combat, but, you know, they're, they're high pressure and, and um, atmospheres and such, and, and oftentimes a lot of them are corrosive, so keep that in mind. All right, so Venus and Here's Earth. Weird. Look at that. It looks just like it does right now. But the other thing that's really cool is with when you're zoomed in, and let's see if you can get the light right, you can see. So there's the landing zone of New York. And here's the landing zone of Frankfurt. And here's the landing zone of Shanghai. And you can see the light coming off of them. Those are the landing zones. There was a stretch goal for a fourth landing zone. Oh wait, no, this one's, is this supposed to be Moscow? I think this is supposed to be Moscow. Yeah, Moscow is one of the landing zones, sorry. But they talked about uh, Frankfurt or London. They, they threw around a few ideas. Pardon me. For uh, a fourth landing zone because it was one of the stretch goals but it's cool that you know they they've got the little thing showing that hey here are the three landing zones on earth and whoop, let's see uh, yeah there's still billions of people new york moscow and oh look at that you can, i didn't realize you could do that click on the landing zone New York, uh, old world architecture stands beside modern design aesthetics along the labyrinthine streets of this historic city. New York is not only the political center of the empire, but a highly influential beacon for culture, technology, and commerce. Moscow, the inspiration behind the adage, you can find anything somewhere. Moscow is one of the largest trading hubs on earth. Uh, largest trading hubs, is in there's multiples. A never ending stream of goods pulsed through the ports of the city giving it a perpetual energy and feeling of a town on the move. Moscow is also the current home to the governor's council. So um, even though Earth is the seat of the UEE, um, it still has a governor's council. And so um, planets within the UEE, uh, planets uh, that are, are recognized, have governor's councils. And the, the it, it's... Um, the, the governors rule the nation states 
with another freaking bot. God dang, the bots are just out of control recently. Why do they why do they like me so much? Ban and report bot you bot block and it says ban evader likely ban evader yeah because these are the, i think these are the same names that we saw the other night but um blizzard blocked for me that's so weird sorry for the distraction um, but the governor's council rules the planet and you can be a governor without being a citizen you know it's the highest rank that a civilian can attain um, but the governors are the ones that rule the you know the, the, the they're the, the the elected leaders you know like the presidents of the nation states of a represented planet in the ue and the council of governors are the ones that rule the that, that rule the planet essentially um so that's how planetary government works uh, versus uh, it's like state government versus um, national government uh, within the U.S. essentially. Shanghai, while home to the largest starport in the state of Asiatica. See, there's still nation states, uh, state of Asiatica. Shanghai began to redesign their city. Hey, Blizzard07, good to see you, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Um... Shanghai began to redesign their city to bring an element of nature back into the super superstructures and skyscrapers, following a movement to restore some of the sitting gardens and parks lost to overpopulation during the 22nd century. So again, this is going to be one of those things like this is how they are able to redesign cities uh, and make the cities, um, you know, their own. They'll be in the you know, the the right territorial location, but they won't look. You know, for the most part, won't look like what we know them to look like now. So, uh, that's Earth. So let's take a look at the article in the star map for Sol or the for Luna, our, our moon, a large natural satellite that is tightly locked with Earth, the first celestial object humanity ever visited. Cool. Now let's read what the Galactopedia says. So Luna, Sol 3A, is the moon of Earth, Sol 3. Tidally locked to Earth, it has long been a subject of fascination for humans and became the first celestial body they visited in standard Earth year 1969, if you believe in the moon landing. Um, in the 22nd century, humans began to experiment with sealed bases on Luna's surface, marking their earliest attempts at colonization outside Earth. The remains of these nascent bases were declared a protected historical site in 2799. Today, Luna is home to multiple robust sealed colonies. So uh, essentially, they're telling us that there are going to be um, sealed colonies on Luna. And what they end up looking like, we don't know, but we'll be able to visit those. But you'll also be able to go and visit these protected historical sites. I guarantee it. You know, and this will be one of those things where um, if you are doing personnel transport stuff, you're flying around in your Spirit E1, right? Yeah, Spirit E1, um, you know, uh, taking people sightseeing and everything like that. This is going to be one of those places where people are going to want to charter flights to go and look and visit these things. I'm very curious to see how CIG goes about making these rope these robust sealed colonies what they end up looking like are they are they domed colonies are they you know subterranean things it just says they're sealed it leaves it kind of open-ended for them but of course this is in here but anything there wasn't anything about sealed colonies or anything in here so um interesting stuff so that's luna and Phobos, doomed to impact Mars. So let's go over here to Mars and we'll read about Mars. And we're also going to read about Mars in the Galactopedia. So this is the tidbit from days gone by, uh, but a prosperous and populous planet. Mars was the, was the first successfully terraformed planet. The process was marred by what is today known as the Mars tragedy, where when a terraforming disaster killed 
4,876 people in 2125. And it was blamed on AI, which is why we, you know, they're, they're very hesitant to adopt AI and do more R&D on AI in-game up until Addison was voted in. And that initi initiative seems to have been uh, stalled. So, um, you know what's really interesting is like, look how big the moon is here next to Earth. And look how big the, like you could barely see the moons around Mars, but they are there and you can clip on them, click on them. So let's zoom back into Mars. So the Galactopedia entry for Mars, Mars Sol 4 is the fourth planet from the sun in the solar system. Populous and prosperous, it was the first planet humans successfully terraformed after a disaster, disastrous initial attempt and provided a much needed outlet for their population during a time of crisis on Earth. Yeah, so um, they're in that population uh, crisis uh, on Earth, and once they're able to colonize Mars, you know, mass exodus, tons of people move there. Its environment was carefully crafted to allow for as much arable land as possible so it could both sustain a self-sufficient colony and grow extra resources to alleviate, alleviate famines on Earth. So um, when you go visit Mars, there's going to be lots and lots of farmland. Even though it's very populous and there's a lot of people living there, there's probably still a lot of farmland because they need to have a sufficient supply of food to be able to uh, export to Earth, even now. The capital, Port Renatus, is a renowned center of art and culture. I can't wait to visit Port Renatus. Um, but gameplay-wise, you know, if there is a ton of arable land for making food, um, not only for the you know, for the population on um, Mars, but also Earth, well, then they're going to be exporting that food and there's going to be plenty of hauling work to take food, you know, foodstuffs from Mars to Earth. And, you know, because the solar system is fairly good size, it's probably not a, a, a super short trip um, from Mars to Sol compared to, you know, um, you know, going from one planet to ne the next in um, Stanton. Uh, Actually, let's read about Port Renatus too while we're at it, just because we're, we're going to go back and check out a few things from day, you know, from previous entries. Uh, Port Renatus is the capital city of Mars, Sol 4, and is the first permanent human settlement to be built on a planet outside Earth. Once Mars' second attempt at ter uh, terraformation was successfully completed in the 22nd century, uh, Port Renatus grew into a city-sized settlement as it became the de facto spaceport for all persons arriving to further develop the planet. The architecture of Port Renatus is studied by historians as an example of humanity's first attempts to build modular cities. So there we go. We've got some descriptions uh, of what the, the sort of style guide for Port Renatus will be. Ugh. So let's go back to... Uh, reading about Phobos, which is uh, one of the moons for Mars. Let's see, is it this one, right? Yeah, this is Phobos, yep. Let's see what this entry says. Only 6,000 kilometers away, Phobos orbits Mars so fast that it appears to rise in the west and set in the east twice every Martian day. But on here, it says Phobos Sol 4a is the closest moon to Mars Sol 4. The larger of the planet's two satellites, it is a non spheroid object with a jagged surface covered in grooves and streaks. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Phobos will be pulled in by Mars gravity and will break apart during its descent. Um, so it doesn't, you know, not habitable, but it doesn't say anything about anything on the moon. Um, whether there's anything mineable there or if there's any uh, moon colonies there, we don't know. And Deimos. Misshapen Rock. That's me. Let's see what the star map says. With a radius of only 6.2 kilometers, so tiny, Deimos's size and lumpy shape bear more of a resemblance to an asteroid than a moon. Deimos is the second and farthest moon from the surface of Mars. At only 6.2 kilometers in diameter, it bears a strong resemblance to an asteroid. 
One leading theory proposes that it originated as uh, a part of a larger asteroid that was hit by another object and shattered. Uh, Blizzard says, do you think the star map and CAJ's plans will update if we end up finding Planet Nine? I would surely, I would, I would really hope so. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, probably not much reason to visit Deimos, but it is there. And there's the Herschel Belt. Uh, so the Herschel Belt. Whoops. So let's. Whoops. Oh. Let's see. Can I right click on? That's not what I right clicked on. It doesn't let you right click on the Herschel belt. I was curious to see if there was an entry in the or star map for it. The Herschel belt, Soul Belt Alpha, is an asteroid belt in the solar system. Uh, located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, it is where humans first began to experiment with asteroid mining. Pure water ice harvested from the belt helped ease the water crisis during the human overpopulation era in the 21st and 22nd centuries uh, of standard Earth year. So, um, we know that ice mining uh, is going to be a thing. Uh, we uh, In-game, they've talked about it. Whether that's still ongoing, we don't know. Whether there's other things that are worth mining in the Herschel Belt, we don't know. So, not much to go on there. Io, volcanically active, and that's Jupiter. So let's go over to Jupiter. Let's read the entry here. The gas giant is the largest planet in the solar system. <laughs> Lame. Let's see what this one says. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the center of the solar system. A gas giant, it is the largest and most massive planet in the system. During the human colonial, colonial expansion era, humans constructed some of their earliest attempts at hydrogen fuel refineries around Jupiter. Those that failed were either abandoned or purposely knocked out of orbit so they would be captured by the planet's gravity and plummet into its stormy atmosphere. So uh, I would assume that there's still hydrogen fuel refineries there. So you can go, would be able to go there to refuel as well as pick up fuel for transport using your uh, Starfare. That is one of the roles of the Starfare that most people don't realize that fuel transport from, you know, taking it from a refinery to other, other stations or even planets and such. But I imagine that those, you know, those that failed that are probably, that might still be in orbit, you could, there could be uh, salvage, you know, just available yeah, that's still in orbit. All right, so Io, Sol 5A. Let's see, is it this one? No, that's Callisto. Ah. I hate how it does that. Io, okay. Thanks to tidal heating, Io experiences extreme geologic activity, making it the driest and most volcanically active object in the solar system. So, Io Sol 5A is a moon of the Jupiter due to tidal heating uh, and the presence of a subsurface ocean of molten and solid rock. Io is the most geologically active object in the solar system. Armor manufacturer Caldera utilizes the surface, as of, uh, surface of Io as a test bed for its newest environmental suits. Interesting. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there might be testing facilities, maybe in orbit, you know, as well as uh, maybe even having the option to go there to um, test armor and everything like that. That would be really interesting to visit and see. The Caldera suits are pretty cool looking. And Europa. See, this one is Europa, I believe. Yep. Europa's icy surface makes it one of the most reflective moons in the solar system. Uh, Europa is a moon of Jupiter uh, coated with a sheet of water ice that hides a brackish o ocean 
Europa is uh, from, um, oh gosh, what's the co-op game? Or the co-op submarine game. That's lots of fun. It's very difficult though. That's on, on Europa. Uh, its surface is crisscrossed with vast cracks that appear when tidal heating induces too much stress upon it. In standard Earth year 2431, single-celled organisms were discovered living under the ice. Uh, the, the ones that eat me when I play that game weren't single-celled. Multiple institutes of higher learning maintain permanent bases on Europa that they use to study these creatures. Hey, Ravixi, good to see you. How's it going? So, uh, if there are institutes and universities that have um, research bases on Europa, you better believe that there's going to be science gameplay involved, as well as transporting resources um, and, and people uh, to and from there. Uh, but I imagine that there will be, you know, you can go there and, and do different, you know, whatever science gameplay ends up being. I would imagine that you would be able to do it on Europa. You'd have a reason to go there, especially if you're trying to further your reputation with those organizations. Yeah, Europa is going to be interesting. Uh, I think any place that hints at science gameplay is going to be more interesting than people give it credit for. Why did that suddenly pop up on the screen? The frame counter? Huh. Socially Confused says, Visiting the solar system will be a highlight. I want to see the moon landing, the Hollywood set. <laughs> but I'm... Psh but I really want to see it on the moon. Yeah, I, the, the, you know, the, the, the moon, the, not only do I expect to be able to visit the, the moon landing site, but also the, um, um, the, 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 the historical sites of the early settlements that they built there. Um, yeah, I want to go visit those. I think it'd be really cool to see how CIG, builds and what it ends up looking like you know when you go to a uh, what is essentially a, a fictional historical site you know what what's that like and fly through the grand canyon i would i would be disappointed if things like the grand canyon didn't exist on earth in game yeah I, I, it'll be interesting to see how they represent it i think that they they can with everything technologically that CIG has been able to do and what they're intending to do in the future and, and what the other companies are, are making happen. I think that they can do a good job of representing Earth in game in a way that's believable enough. Um, so we'll see. You know, th there's going to be a, a good amount of suspension of disbelief, but with how big they can make planets and how much play area, usable space they have on them, you know, it, it's going to be good. Yeah, even if they avoid the historic sites, at least give us the geographical ones. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, um, the you know, Mount Everest. <laughs> I'm just going to fly my ship up there and be like, yep, I'm going to climb the last five feet. <laughs> but it's interesting how these entries differ, uh, differ from the Galactopedia entries. Because they, they've, they, people think that, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the Galactopedia updates have lots of new lore in them. There's lots of expansions to the lore within the Galactopedia updates. Hold on, I'm going to get rid of that stupid, um, counter. Blizzard says, I want to leave uh, a lone beer can on top of Everest. Yeah, the geography should be doable for Earth at least. Plenty of data to feed that model. Oh yeah, yeah. The the Planet Tech V five would would make short work of of Earth, uh, uh, considering it's designed to you know be able to make up planets from you know a, a, a data stream, you know to sort of make them believable. A Callisto Protocol. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where was it? Oh, Ganymede. Bigger. Oh, we missed. Ganymede. Oops. Dang it. Oh, here's Ganymede. 
So Ganymede says Ganymede is the solar system's largest moon and the only one with a magnetosphere. It is bigger than Mercury and only slightly smaller than Mars. Yeah, it's a big ass moon. Ganymede is a moon of Jupiter, the largest moon in the solar system. It is, its diameter is greater than that of the planet Mercury. Before Ganymede's subsurface ocean was explored in the 25th century standard Earth year, it was popularly speculated that the moon may have had extraterrestrial life. No forms of life in the past or present have thus far been discovered. Uh, yep, there's going to be science gameplay there. They're going to want you to take samples and do scans of the subsurface ocean um, in order to continue to look for uh, life on Ganymede. I mean, if they're if there's research institutes on Europa, I, I, I bet they're on the, the surface of Ganymede. But otherwise, it doesn't give us much to go on on reasons to go there. But that's my, my guess. But um, here's a station in orbit of Ganymede. So, uh, though it's no longer in active service since the Marine Forces stationed here were reassigned to Mars, the base remains strictly off limits. <laughs> okay. You think that's going to stop me? <laughs> you think you think it, it, it being off limits and a few patrols being there is going to stop me from going to an abandoned uh, UE Marine base? Um, yeah, they, they put that for a reason. I want to go to that derelict station and explore it and uh, let my, my grabby hands grab what I can find. Yeah. So that's Ganymede. Uh, okay, now we'll go to Callisto. Uh, Callisto, the tidally locked surface of Callisto is the oldest and most heavily cratered in Seoul. Callisto is a moon of Jupiter. Of all the celestial bodies in the solar system, Callisto's surface is the most heavily cratered. Uh, because, because it has never been geologically active, it is home to multiple sealed settlements and a handful of specialized resorts that cater to people who suffer from seismophobia. How random. How random is that? <laughs> Let's drop off Vandal NPCs at, say, London. See what happens. Abandoned, yeah. Shiny, free guns and ship tech. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the... So, realistically, if it was the actual Marines, you know... Uh, and it says the Marines there were reassigned. It doesn't mean that the station necessarily is abandoned. But it just means that there's no Marines stationed there. So there might be people, you know, a, a mothball crew maintaining the station. So who knows? Uh, might be the Polaris changes. Are you talking about that video that came out where they talked about the increased SCU, the tractor beam in there, how, how it now has two ramps, you know, uh, going into the cargo bay, one on each side? Oh, the, yeah, the, I think it's the, was it the turret that's under the nose got increased to size six? I mean, I, uh, I, I will I will believe it when I see it but until I get something a bit more concrete like from CIG actually and like game files and such then I'll believe it but yeah cool if it happens I also but I also don't want the Polaris upgunned too much I I like the whole outgun what it can't outrun outrun what it can't outgun it was a data mine. How come I didn't see it? Where did it come from? Yeah, the I, I I don't like the idea of the Polaris being able to, you know, fight another capital ship with its guns. That's like ships need to have weaknesses, you know. Um, but it, you know. Yeah, it, it it'll uh, I I'll believe it when I see it. Um, yeah, the a tier two med bed on the players absolutely makes sense. I mean, the when we looked at the the images and stuff from the the white box and everything, it, like there should be it looks like a tier two and maybe two tier threes. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it absolutely makes sense to have a tier two med bed. You know, it, it's 
you know, and I'm sure there'll be a tier two med bed on the Idris. You know, I, I always expected it to have a tier two med bed. I still don't want it to have regen, but I expected a tier two med bed. I expected to have more than one med bed, but hopefully it's like one tier two and like two tier threes or something like that. But if they're right and the PDC guns on the players are in and work for 4.0, that will be very fun. Well, and so on that note, Dell, and before we continue on with the Galactopedia, remember what um, John Cruz said about the Idris? And I want to say, didn't he say that the Idris K variant would come out when the Idris came out? Well, the Idris, K, the Idris K has PDCs. That's one of the, the, like, everybody's like, ooh, laser. And I'm like, no, ooh, PDCs. Cool. You know, um, so if the Polaris has PDCs and they work, uh, yeah, very fun. I, like, I bought a Polaris at Concept in 2016. And I've been waiting for it ever since, and I'm super hyped for it. I'll be even more hyped for it once we have the Legionnaire and I can put my Legionnaire on board. But otherwise, like to me, that's that's my mo that's my mobile base. You know, talk to me when they bring out the BX. Yeah, the box. Uh, wait, the M doesn't have P. No, the the M's turrets are manned. They're not PDCs. They're manned turrets. Um, that was the the big deal with the Idris K was the that they're PDCs. It, it, it just, uh, yeah, here I will, let's see, one second. Aegis Idris K. I'll pull up the Q&A. Wasn't there a Q&A? Hold on. Pulling up the links. the oh wait no I can go to hold on I'm gonna go to the I should be able to go to the the store page for it Shop, pledge store, and how do I search now? Let's see, Idris, okay. What? It doesn't pop up. Maybe is it in my hangar? Dang, how do I find it? Um, mm, nope, that's not it. Hmm. How do I find it? Where's that image? There's an image of...
Oh man, the Yeah, I, I love the idea of PDCs. Um why are we looking at soul? Is it gonna be in 4.0? <laughs> I could see CIG using Earth. I, that's not a bad idea. You know, I mean it, it, as being able to demonstrate like what it can do, you know, that they're building. It'll be really interesting because they've been they've been playing it really close to their chest. Sorry, I got distracted with the Idris K stuff because I, I have the, the K upgrade kit to my Idris P. Yeah, it'll be because I, you know, I mean, I, I guarantee that's something they're going to show off. They've talked about it, but they just haven't given us much in the way of details. So it'll be interesting to see their progress. Uh, so the multiple sealed settlements and a handful of specialized resorts that cater to people who suffer from seismophobia. So people who are afraid of earthquakes. Hey, the drift. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. So, I mean, obviously you'll be able to, to visit these places. It, I, I just, for me, like it, personnel transport of people who are specifically uh, seismophobic. I, what do you want to bet those people? Like you have to fly super smooth. You know, like if there's any sort of turbulence, they just absolutely lose their shit. I mean, that, that's the kind of weird uh, transport mission I could see CIG throwing in there. All right, so that's Callisto. Uh, Titan, shaped by a methane cycle. Whoops. Oh, zoomed out too far. All right. Do, do, do. So, whoop. Let's see. Which one is... No. Miranda. Actually, let's read about... Uranus. Oh, wait, no. Saturn. Whoops. Where's... Ah, okay. So there's your... Here's Saturn. All right. Let's read about Saturn real quick. The gas giant best known for its set of planetary rings. So Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun in the solar system, the second largest planet in the system. It is also the least dense and has long been a subject of fascination to humans due to its beautiful set of rings. Vacation homes that orbit Saturn with a view of the rings are some of the most prized pieces of real estate in the system and the more luxur luxurious ones are often sold for billions of credits. There's your gameplay, folks. Um, if you want to earn lots of UEC to be able to afford one of the vacation homes, you know, in orbit of Saturn, I guarantee you those will be in game and available for purchase. But I also would be willing to bet that there will be like high rep transport missions to bring people in cargo to and from, uh, people in supplies and stuff to and from these, um, vacation homes that are in orbit, you know, especially essentially private space stations in orbit of Saturn. Like that's cool. You know, Yeah, I think that there's going to be a lot more PDCs in game in the future or options to swap out turrets for PDCs with a, you know, some form of, um, you know, I mean, obviously there's AI blades and everything, but I, I think that there's going to, going to be other options um, with, you know, some sort of, you know, cost essentially, you know, uh, uh, swapping a, a, a PDC, but it's a, a lower you know, weapon size, you know, who knows? Yeah, so lots of stuff that gets added in the Galactopedia updates. So let's uh, read about Titan. So Titan is a moon of Saturn, the largest of Saturn's moons. Its nitrogen methane atmosphere is denser than that of Earth. <coughs> Pardon me. Titan is dotted with lakes and rivers of liquid hydrocarbons. Um, so they have oil uh, and its climate has created surface features such as dunes seas and canyons all shaped by a methane cycle rather than a water cycle Connie Phoenix is the smallest ship uh, with one I can think of but I could be wrong yeah and, and that's just what we know of now pardon me 
So let's see. Titan. That's a Hapidus. Mm, this one? Nope. There we go. Uh, Saturn's largest natural satellite has long been of great interest to scientists. With rivers and lakes of ethane and methane, Titan is the only moon in the solar, in the solar system with a dense atmosphere. Yeah, so there's definitely going to be some scientific research going on there. Why does this have a spinny thing? What's going on with that? What does that mean? Rhea, we'll, we'll get to that. Rhea, jagged surface. Information made mainly of rock and ice. Rhea is commonly referred to as a dirty snowball due to its composition. Dirty snowball. That just sounds like something from Urban Dictionary. Rhea is a moon of Saturn um, composed of water and ice rock. It has numerous high albedo ice cliffs. What does al albedo mean? It is the amount of light that a surface reflects and it can be used to describe it. Okay, so very reflective ice cliffs that appear as streaks on the surface when viewed from space with the naked eye. Although it does experience some endogenic activity in the form of cryo, in the forms of cryovolcanoes, it is only slightly geologically active. Hmm. I feel like the 890 should not only have PDCs, but I feel like the 890 should also like because the 890 I don't think has uh, VTOL thrusters on its belly. I feel like all the large ships that don't have VTOL thrusters on their bellies, um, like the Carrick does, um, should get them when they get updated, you know, for their gold standard, um, to be able to function in land and in an atmosphere. <laughs> Do not look it up. Okay. I will not look up the dirty snowball. <laughs> uh, okay. So that's rare. See, that's really interesting. Like why does on scene it went away? Hmm. It had an orbiting ring and now it's, but it was a UI element, and now it's not there. Tethys, made mostly of water ice. Uh, was it this one? That's Rhea. Tethys. There we go. Tethys is predominantly made of water ice, which gives it a much uh, it gives it a density much lower than other celestial object objects its size. Tethys is a moon of Saturn, one of the least dense of all the major moons in the solar system. It is made almost entirely of water ice. Due to uh, tidal and rotational forces, it is not quite round, uh, taking a slightly elliptical shape. Hematite and iron have been detected in trace amounts on its surface. If it's in trace amounts, probably not worth it for mining, but maybe there's water uh, uh, ice mining. Um, we know that that's a thing. I'm watching cat videos to, ch to cleanse. <laughs> the Blizzard says the 890 should uh, doesn't need VTOLs because it should not leave the water. Yes. Um, but like, you know, it, it needs to be able to land. It's a giant freaking heavy ass yacht. And, you know, without VTOLs, it shouldn't be able to land on a planet. Like, it should just come crashing down to the surface. You know, and like, uh, even the Caterpillar. You know, caterpillar. You know, everything should have it based off of it being weighty or not. Should have sufficient belly thrust to be able to land on the planet. I mean, they made a big deal about the Zeus CL having uh, belly uh, VTOL thrusters to handle the increased weight of being able to carry all the SCU it does. So you know that CIG is thinking about it. You know that this is a thing. Um, and you know, the, the, um, you know, the Carrick has them. I want to say the Odyssey has them as well. It's just, it's, you know, like the hammerhead should have them. Yeah. Anything successfully once. I saw some great UE5 renders of the 890 in water and it looked stunning. You know, maybe that'll be a thing. Maybe we can drive it around on the water, you know, big old speedboat style. All right, um, so that's Tethys and Dione, heavily bombarded. Which one's Dione? 
This one? There we go. Strangely, this tidally locked moon features numerous impact craters on its trailing hemisphere, leading scientists to speculate that heavy bombardment from objects once spun Dione 180 degrees. Uh, marked with numerous impact craters in Chasmata, it is theorized that Dione went through a period of heavy meteor strikes in the distant past that turned the moon 180 degrees on its axis. After the Battle of Orion resulted in the loss of that system to the Vanduul and Sander Earth here 2712, a conspiracy theory, tinfoil hats everybody, alleging that the Vanduul had performed this bombardment emerged on Spectrum. I, I've, that, there's got to be some gameplay on that. There, there's got to be like, you know, some sort of contracts that you can take to go and scan these bombardments or something like that, or, or you know, like, I don't know. If they don't make that something, you know, in game that you can have something to do with, I'll, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> All right, Iapetus, two-tone moon. There's a moon of Saturn. Is it this one? Yep, here we go. Tidally locked to Saturn, Iapetus is unusual because of its two-tone coloration. The side facing Saturn is constantly shroud shrouded in shadow while the more distant side is illuminated. Uh, let's see. Tidally locked to Saturn, the leading hemisphere of the moon is much darker than that of the trailing hemisphere, giving it a striking two-tone coloration. Dust that has fallen from Saturn's rings over time sits in a 12 centimeter layer on the surface of the moon's leading hemisphere, giving it a darker appearance. See, not giving us much, you know, in terms of reason to go there. But again, like they've, CIG has said, there's going to be plenty of locations and and planetary bodies within Star Citizen that don't have a reason for you to go there other than just to say you did. You know, not everything has to have a specific purpose. You know, they, they want to, they want things to be believable. You know, um, and that was something that was brought up in regards to Pyro because they're like, you know, is every planet going to be, you know, landable and habitable, blah, blah, blah. And well, not, you know, the planets in Pyro aren't all habitable. You know, it just, you know, now one has an atmosphere you know that didn't um but they 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 did say that you know they you know they, they updated pyro because it's the second system and they wanted you know and, and the original lore for pyro came out when you know there wasn't um landable planets uh, but they're still gonna have planets that you don't have a reason to land on or that aren't really feasible to land on or even visit yeah, exploration just for exploration's sake. Uh, let's see. Next. Uh, Miranda. To topographically dramatic. And let's go out to Uranus. <laughs> so let's read about Uranus first. <laughs> Uranus, Uranus, however you want to say it. Uh, this ice giant has an unusual lopsided magnetic field due to a dramatic tilt of its axis that places its north and south poles where most other planets have their equator. Fun fact. Uh, pale blue in color, it is an ice giant with an atmosphere that is made mostly of water, ammonia, and methane. The UE government runs orbital research centers dedicated to the study of weather phenomena on Uranus, which remains some of the least understood in the known universe. Research stations in orbit of Uranus. Cool. So there's your lots of science gameplay in the solar system. Lots of science going on there. But, you know, every time you have a scientific facility, not only is there going to be science gameplay going on there that will you'll go there and you'll get missions to go scan this go drop a probe here you know maybe you'll be able to perform you know experiments of some sort um you know it, it's going to be a lot of data gathering yeah it, in, in my opinion um but those facilities are also going to need people brought to in from them and they're also going to need supplies brought to them you know scientists got to eat 
Uh, so let's see. And see, there's another one. Oh. See, they have this one has the the rings. This one has little ringy things. These ones do not. I don't know what that means. Miranda, uh, and let's see which one's Miranda. Nope, Titania. Miranda. Okay. Miranda is one of the smallest objects in the solar system known to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. Its extreme and varied to, uh, topography includes the Verona Rupes, Rupees, which features the tallest cliff in the system. Uh, round and tidally locked, it, is, uh, it has an unusually high orbital inclination that suggests in the past that it was in orbital resonance with Umbriel, uh, so 7C, for a period of time. Although massive enough to have achieved a round shape, the topography of its surface is so dramatic that some scientists theorize that it was partially shattered during its formation period. So scientists uh, are interested in it and have theorized stuff. If there's a theory, they're going to want to prove it out. So there's going to be scientific expeditions to go to Miranda, um, and do scans and, and you know, drop probes, that sort of thing. Uh, Ariel, base of operations for weather scientists. <laughs> Who would have thought more science gameplay? And it, that's the theme for the, the, the unspoken theme for the solar system. Like people talk about going to earth and everything and, um, you know, go, you know, I mentioned going to Mars, but you know, there's going to be a lot of science and gameplay going on there that has nothing to do with earth and Mars or, or even the, the space stations at the Lagrange points. Um, like RSI maintains a, 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 a massive shipbuilding facility at one of the Lagrange points. I forget which one. Um, Ariel is a moon of Uranus. Uh, scientists speculate that the many scarps, canyons, and ridges carved into the moon's surface were created in the distant past by liquid forms of ammonia, methane, or carbon dioxide. The UE operates multiple permanent research stations on Ariel dedicated to the study of Uranus's weather. So, um, so if you're going to be studying weather, uh, I would venture to gather that uh, the flying in the atmosphere of Ariel is going to be a bit treacher treacherous and, and potentially very difficult. But you're, again, science gameplay, so maybe more dangerous science gameplay, um, but as well as uh, moving people and supplies um, to from uh, those research stations. It'll be really interesting to see what these research stations look like. Because we have these really small science outposts um on some of the moons in stanton but you know those are just an early first pass they're so dated i imagine these research stations are probably going to be a lot bigger a lot more fleshed out and more varied in the future hydrate let's see so where were we that's Miranda, Ariel, all right. The surface of this moon is crisscrossed by an extensive network of scarps, canyons, and ridges. Um, yep, carved out by liquid ammonia, methane, or carbon dioxide. Okay, and Umbriel seems to have an eye. So this one, yep. This moon's name has its roots in Latin, uh, in the Latin word umbra, which means shadow. Pardon me. An appropriate reference considering Umbriel is the darkest of all Uranian moons. Um, Umbriel is a moon of Uranus, one of the darkest in color of the moons of Uranus. One of the largest, one of its largest craters has a ring of reflective material on its floor, making Umbriel appear as if it has a single small eye. Um, visual artist uh, Tamsa Wheel utilized uh, ice harvested from this ring as the centerpiece in her standard Earth Year 2949 sculpture, The Anthropic Principle. Hmm. Interesting tidbit. 
doesn't really give us any reason to go there other than maybe people wanting to see the eye uh, Titania the largest of Uranus's moons where'd it go Is this one nope Ha ha, it's this one down here. Nope, Oberon. This one. Nope, this one. There it is. Titania is Uranus's largest moon. Enormous canyons and scarps cut through its surface. Scientists believe they were created after, after an interior expansion occurred during the moon's evolution. Interesting. Uh, under its surface is a mantle of slushy ice that sits over a solid rocky core. It has a tenuous atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Nothing too interesting to do with Titania. And this is the last moon for Uranus, Oberon, which we also have a system, uh, the Oberon system, which is one I'm really interested in visiting. Uranus, Uranus's second largest moon was named after a mythical fairy king, from a famous 16th century play. Its surface is, co is covered in impact craters and appears red in color due to space weathering. Alright. So, Oberon is a moon of Uranus. Um, slightly red in color. It is it likely obtained its hue from the accretion of materials from other parts of the Uranus system. Meteorite impacts have also knocked ice from the surface, leaving dark non-ice material behind that has contributed to Oberon's hue. Alright, so let's back out and let's see what else there is in the soul system before we leave. So, here is uh, the I, uh, Imperial Navy Station Dunleavy. So, INS Dunleavy, you know, kind of like INS Jericho. So, let's read about that. That is... Uh, uh, the Orbital Naval Base acts as the main operational center for the main Soul Fleet. So because this is Soul and it's the heart of the Empire, um, don't care what the Terrans think, um, there's a massive Navy base at the Soul Davian Jump Point, which would essentially be the one of the, one of the main, you know, Davian and Croshaw, the main jump points coming into the Soul System. Or the, the two jump points coming into the solar system. So, yeah, it makes sense to have a, a massive Navy base there. Um, and then TDD Kessner. So, um, trade development. Um, yeah, TD, just like the, um, the trade terminals we use now. A major shipping hub where most cargo moving to Earth is first processed to help alleviate congestion on the Empire's capital world. So this is just a, a one of our, you know, uh, stations that's at the, the jump points, you know, where they, you know, have a cargo deck and everything, you know. Um, and then I don't think it shows anything else here. Uh, let's read about Neptune. Because Neptune is still here. Ice Giant, who has different rotation, uh, contributes to having the strongest winds in the solar system. So let's see. Uh, let's search Neptune. Neptune is the eighth planet from the sun, uh, the densest of the solar system's gas and ice giant planets. Its atmosphere contains high proportions of ice and traces of hydrocarbons. Roughly every two and a half centuries standard Earth year, Neptune and Pluto um, swap orbital positions for about 20 years. Um, do they even have Pluto on? There it is. All right. This dwarf planet was the first Kuiper Belt object to ever be discovered and is probably made of ice and rock. So what is Pluto? Dwarf planet, one of the farthest celestial bodies from the sun of the Earth the solar system. Not the most distant object, it is included as an honorary ninth planet in star charts due to its relative proximity to the Croshaw solar jump point. Ah, okay. 
After humans first discovered jump points, interest in Pluto skyrocketed, and countless permanent sealed settlement shops and research stations were erected there despite its frigid climate. This gave Pluto enough population and economic importance that it was one of the earliest planets to be recognized by the U, uh, UNE Senate after its formation in Santa Earth year 2380. So apparently Pluto is a recognized planet, uh, like as in it has Senate recognition. So the, uh, we'll be able to visit Pluto and there's sealed settlements with lots of shops and research stations there. Apparently it has a, a, a big enough population and enough influence to warrant having Senate representation. You know, whether, you know, it still warrants that, I mean, this far in the future, because, I mean, there are a lot of other planets that, like, um, Cascom doesn't have Senate representation. You know, has, you know, multiple cities on it, you know, the, the main city being Sherman and everything like that, but Pluto, you know, has um, sealed uh, towns and cities, you know, uh, on, on its surface. So, you know, we'll be able to visit Pluto and Star Citizen considers Pluto, uh, even even though it's a, uh, considers it a, a dwarf planet, considers a planet because of its proximity to the uh, Croshaw Sol Jump Point. So cool. Let's zoom out. I think we covered everything in the Sol system. Not just the moons. Oh, let's uh, see if the Kuiper Belt is listed before we call it an evening. Kuiper Belt. Nope. There is not a Galactopedia entry for the Kuiper Belt. Just the, the Herschel Belt um, in the, the solar system. But yeah, that, that seems to be... Um, it seems to be either the f most distant celestial object because the Kuiper belt is at like 49 to 50 AU from the sun or because the Sol Croshaw jump point is way out here that may be considered the most distant celestial object even though it's not a, a physical object and that might be where they measure because there are other systems where if you use the, uh, the route marker thing and you go from a the a jump point that's way out in the system um to the the star within the system it'll give you the exact size of the system and it's based off the radius not the um uh not the not the diameter so something to think about uh, well all the other asteroid belts are are named Come on. Yeah, see the Herschel belt is named. You know, Tiber belt, Alpha, you know, all the other ones. So for some reason they don't have the, the Kuiper belt in Seoul. Yeah, orbiting planets when. Uh, they've definitely said they want to do that and that it is intended and that's their goal. Uh, but it's one of those things that's not super important. Yeah, but you know, it, it's going to be a bit of a technological hurdle. I want it to happen uh, just because I think it will make, you know, uh, route planning, you know, and logistics a bit more interesting if things aren't static. You know, um, if the planets rotate, how come they can, you know, why not have them orbit too? Yeah, that, that's just my thought. So uh, that is all we have for here. Let's go ahead and switch screens. So that is all I have for the Galactopedia update this evening. Uh, and let's see, this was what episode of Lorik was gameplay episode 27. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me this evening. I hope you found this interesting. Um, I think the solar system is far more interesting than people get it credit and give it credit for. You know, yeah, we live here now, but we only live on Earth, and you know, 30th century Earth is far different. Um, but it sounds like the solar system is going to have a lot going for it in terms of science and research gameplay. 
Um, I'm particularly interested in visiting Port Renatus and, and Mars, as well as the uh, lunar colonies. Um, and, you know, knowing that we're going to be able to visit Pluto and Pluto has Senate representation. I mean, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, and of course, there's an abandoned, abandoned UE marine base in orbit of what we say it was Jupiter or one of the moons uh, orbiting Jupiter. So I'm definitely going to go there. I'm definitely going to go there and get shot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's all I have this evening. I'm going to call it a night so I can get some more sleep tonight. Uh, and that way I'll have hopefully have the energy to do more zero to hero tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night um, with uh, my um, trusty Cutter Rambler, the Loot Goblin. Um, we will cross our fingers that Star Citizen doesn't Star Citizen me uh, tomorrow night, that we have a little bit better play experience than we did on the last stream. Because um, we definitely ran into some issues in the last stream that we didn't on the previous two. But, um, yeah, good night, everybody. Cheers. Uh, oh, let's find someone to raid. We've got to be responsible. Good to see you, Rigsby. Thanks for coming and hanging out again. Uh, let's see. 